conversations with a forward-looking perspective about the most important issues in education. I'm Jennifer Cheatham, Senior Lecturer on Education and Co-Chair of the Public Education Leadership Project. The Public Education Leadership Project, or PELP, was designed by the Harvard Graduate School of Education in partnership with the Harvard School of Business to improve the management and leadership competencies of public school leaders in order to drive greater educational outcomes in the largest public school districts. Since its inception, PELP has partnered with 46 urban school districts from across 25 states that represent more than 5 million students annually, providing a critical space for education leaders to address the most challenging problems. I look forward to introducing today's speakers, three public school district leaders who are here in part as a result of relationships we've developed through PELP. But first, a little housekeeping. Today's episode is being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and Facebook page. You can also visit hgse.me forward slash future for recordings and information on future episodes. Please submit your questions throughout today's webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You will also find, uh, or at some point, we're gonna get the closed caption access figured out as well. Now, I'm delighted to welcome our guests. Brenda Caselius is the superintendent of the Boston Public Schools, responsible for educating 54,000 students right here in the city I now live. She has been an educator for more than three decades, including former commissioner of education in Minnesota. She's also held key leadership roles in Minneapolis public schools and in Memphis. She has devoted her career to ensuring all children receive an equitable, exceptional, and joyful education. Joe Davis is the superintendent of the Ferguson Florissant School District serving 11,000 students in Ferguson, Missouri. He's done it all, served as bus driver, teacher, assistant principal, principal, deputy chief, and superintendent, a true equity warrior. He was drawn to Ferguson following the death of Michael Brown and has expanded opportunities and access for all students from preschool through graduation. And I must add, he is an HGSE grad. Hey, Santa hey. hey. <laughs> Jackson is the Chief Executive Officer of Chicago Public Schools, the third largest school district in the country with an enrollment of over 350,000 students. It's also the place I consider home. She attended CPS as a student and served as a teacher, principal, network chief, chief education officer there prior to her current role. As CEO, she has focused on improving equity and access to high quality education in all CPS schools. I do want to acknowledge that Richard Carranza, Chancellor of New York City, was originally scheduled to join us, but can no longer make it. We wish the Chancellor the very best as they reopen schools this week. So please join me in welcoming these three district leaders as our very special guests. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. All right, we're getting this launch right in. I'm gonna set us up with a little bit of framing first. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank each of you for taking time out of your extraordinarily busy schedules to speak with us today. I know you are each feeling the weight of your responsibility right now. Boston started their school year virtually just this week, and Chicago and Ferguson Florissant started just a few weeks ago. You have been working tirelessly to lead your communities through this crisis while simultaneously exploring opportunities to make positive change. The pandemic we all know has laid bare the racial inequities we face in school systems. Um, none of that is news to us. Inequities that are now being exacerbated by the crisis resulting in dire consequences, especially for many students and families of color. The racial justice movement to ensure that Black Lives Matter is demanding change in all of our major institutions, including PK-12 public schooling. While it is hard to look ahead when we are embroiled in the current crisis, we must do so if we are to have any chance at realizing the hopes and dreams of this generation of young people and the generations that follow. 
Today, we're going to talk, some real talk, I hope, about what it means to lead for racial equity, both now and in the future. And I want to dig right in. Um, I know each of you, and I know that as long as I've known you, you have had an explicit focus on racial equity. Why is that important, perhaps especially now and in the future? Anybody want to kick, kick us off? Who's the oldest on the panel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's go with the baby. You go, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Janice, go for it. I'm getting called out. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, as you stated, equity has has always been at the fore um, in my mind as I think about this work, whether that be, you know, from my beginning stages as a classroom teacher. One of the reasons I was interested in leadership was because of the inequities that, that I, I witnessed um, as a teacher early on. And when I compared that to my prior experience in the same school system, um, it just made me wonder about um, how uh, decisions are made that, that give opportunities to certain students and, and do not provide those opportunities to others. Um, I was blessed to have those opportunities and have made it my life's work to make sure that other students get those same opportunities because I really think it's, it's a matter of the right school, the people you know, the experiences that you have that make all the difference. And unfortunately for far too many of our students that that is not the case. Um, what I've done in this role that I've been pretty proud of is not only naming equity as a, as a focus explicitly, because although it's always been a part of the work that we've done here in CPS, I know you know that, Jan, from your time here, yeah. it wasn't called out explicitly. Now, it's called out in our uh, mission and vision for the district. It's called out in our strategic plan where not only do we identify our goals, but we identify specific goals towards equity so that we're, we're, we're not just trying to make sure all tides rise and mask the disparities that we know exist underneath that. Um, and, and so I think that's important. I also have been proud of the equity office that we've created, situated in that office as a senior level uh, position reporting directly to me, uh, which I think is critically important and also giving them a budget and authority to make decisions on behalf of the district so that there are some real teeth in, in this notion around equity. With that said, I've learned a lot about this work. Um, I've learned that it, it feels like you can try, you know, your your hardest, and you, we're only getting so far. And we, when we have setbacks, and, and setback isn't even the right word, when we have incidents like what happened uh, last uh, yesterday with Brianna Taylor, it just makes it feel even more discouraging. Um, but after reflecting on that and absorbing that pain, it only reinforces me as I, as well as my teachers and principals and all the other educators working on behalf of children in CPS to do more, to remove the barriers, to remove the policies and all the things that we know that get in the way um, from, from bringing about the kind of equality that we think is necessary. So it's important because it's the, it's, there's a moral imperative um, and I'm just happy to be in this position and able to, to make some change. Thank you, Janice. Joe, do you wanna dive in? Sure, I can. Um, I and think that- explicit. Yeah, make sure you can hear me well. I had these technical issues, I apologize. We can hear yeah. you great, yeah. And you, so I just wanna quickly, it just tag on to what Janice has mentioned already is, is that it, we have a moral imperative in front of us because you know, we've seen the issues with race across our country already, especially with uh, the brutality of, of black men, period. Um, and I think that you know what the pandemic has done, the um, COVID pandemic is, is shown us these deep seated inequities in our communities. Uh, COVID has shown us the inequities when it comes to healthcare. Uh, but now with you know, the impact it's had on public schools, we also see the deep inequities in education. We know the data, the data is pretty clear about what our students are, are not getting. And especially black and brown children, particularly black males in this country, and, and what we have to do is be super clear about what we're after when, it, when we talk about equity. It can't just be a buzzword. It's got to be the work. And, and my wife and I are raising a Black son. And I, I have to have these conversations with him about how he should operate at 15 years old because I want to see him when he uh, is, comes, comes home from school. 
But more importantly, I want to make sure that he's getting the kind of education that's going to prepare him for life. And that hasn't been happening for Black children across this country, if not across this globe. Uh, having worked in CPS and lived in Boston, it is it prevalent all over, and especially here in Ferguson. Uh, and, and when I talk about the inequities, you know, it's not enough to get a, a high school diploma. You have to have the skills to be able to speak well and to think well and to, and to, to navigate the world. And I know we'll get into some of this, but that is why it's so important now more, more than ever before. Thank you, Joe. Brenda, why do you lead for racial equity? When, why are you explicit? Oh, well, first of all, Janice and Joe did such a great job. I'm so honored to be on this panel. And thank you, Jan, uh, Jen, for convening it with Harvard and PELP. Um, it's the best professional development I've ever gotten uh, it is the PELP professional development I've had all the times that I've been there. And so um, one of the reason that I lead with it is because it's who I am. And after three days, you know, three decades of doing this work, I'm just tired. <laughs> you know, quite honestly, and you know, there's an urgency in now. And you know, when George Floyd, when we watched for eight eight minutes forty two seconds, that horrible murder happen in front, that now gave us new wind under our wings to in this moment to do something and to do it well because children don't have a voice, and uh, they don't have a rewind. They don't get to do it over again. They, you know, we got to stop waiting and putting it putting it to the next generation and you know someone's got to stand up and be courageous and so you know I want to be that someone I've always been that someone and I've fallen short because our kids our black kids still are not achieving at the levels that they need to be achieving and we need to continue to rally everybody you know one of the reasons I'm here in Boston is because you know I thought coming with mayoral control will help to drive the agenda forward because you can you can uh, rely on all of the weight of city government to, to move the agenda forward and to move it faster without the barriers um, that could be there with a different type of structure and having the commissioner uh, experience and having all this sub cabinet work with under Mark Dayton and all of the you know, kind of coordinated all hands on deck work that's needed to really get at the success because schools can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and black kids aren't gonna get what they need you know, if we don't stand in the gap for them, if we don't put together the connections for their families, children don't come, you know, as just a child, their whole family comes to us. Yeah. It's not just a, a, a children's issue. This is a family and community issue. We allow this to happen. We, we sit by, us adults, we allow this to happen generation after generation yeah. after generation for poor children and mm -hmm. especially poor children of color and poor black children. So no matter how you cut the data, poor black children are on the bottom every mm -hmm. single time. Mm -hmm. And our native kids as well, yeah. um, you know, in communities yeah. where you have uh, tribal nations. And yeah. so I think it's important for us to continue to lift this up, to, to be explicit, to be bold about it, and to continue to talk, to not only talk, but to take action. Mm -hmm. And this is what I love about Dr. E um, Kendrick e Ibram's book, you know, where he talks about policy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to get at it at the policy level. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, I, I'm pretty on fire about it. Yeah. The one I thing I wanted to go ahead, Janice. No, just to build on that. I know we have to keep it moving. I think one thing that is important to note, um, you know, especially as an African-American woman, every time I get a set of data to Brenda's point, you know, uh, black students are, are not meeting um, the standards at the same level as their peers. But I think what we also have to be aware of, too, is the just repeated disinvestment. They're also at the bottom when you look at resource allocation. Mm -hmm. They're at the bottom when you look at opportunities for advancement. Their parents, so if you talk about the larger ecosystem, have right. been locked out and, 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 and not educated properly in a lot of these school systems. And so what mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I'm unapologetic about that. I know that we have that luxury here in a city that is, you know, very liberal. I, you know, my heart goes out to some of my superintendent colleagues who are in places where even the mention of any kind of equity work, you know, is met with mm -hmm. a, a rebuke. Um, but even in this position, I have to make decisions where it is the right decision in advancement of equity, equity and action, as Joe talked about. Um, and sometimes it's hard because these are institutions and things that have been in place and it's always been done this way. And so for leaders across the board, making those decisions are tough, 
but I believe leaders of color are really in a position where we have to do it because if we don't do it, it's not going to happen. That's right. right. You're in the seats, right? Yeah. When we're in the seats, we have to move the ball forward. And yep. um, before we move into even more depth, I just want to stick a pin in something. And I remember reading this book years ago called Tempered Radicals. I don't know if that rings a bell with any of you. I think it was actually brought up by Monica Higgins at Pelt. And, um, and the book was about people who choose to work inside of these systems but are, are, are fighting for a radically different future for children. So uh, what I see and hear in the three of you are people who love what's possible mm -hmm. in school districts, right? The possibilities, the, the mm -hmm. possible future and are incredibly dissatisfied by the same systems that you lead, right? So it's, um, we need the people who are pushing from the outside, but we also need uh, racial equity leaders who are pushing and changing from the inside as well. Um, so it's just powerful to hear from the three of you. Let's, let's dig a little deeper though. And I think um, each of you started to touch on this to some extent. We know that uh, school district strategy should in theory be tied to a robust vision of excellent instruction, right? Mm -hmm teaching and learning in the classroom. And Janice, I'm gonna start with you again. Tell us um, what is your vision, right? For equitable instruction and what might that mean for the work that schools and districts take on? And it may be informed by what you've learned during the crisis as well. But what's yeah. what are we like, after here? A couple of things. I, I think number one, um, and I want to try not to go too far off on a tangent, but one of the things that kind of drives me crazy is it, as we think about the impact of COVID on schooling, which it, the impact is going to be tremendous. And we, we can't even really articulate that now because it, it, it's still in that unknown phase, but we know that it's not going in the right direction. With that said, uh, when I hear people talk about, you know, it's time to, to do something radically different in schools, and I, I agree with that, but I don't think when they say it, we, we are hearing the same thing. So when I think of what we need to do radically different, we need to look at these policies. We need to stop doing things that are extraneous, that don't advance um, student learning for anybody, white, black, Latino, et cetera. I think that's number one. I also think that what works in schooling across the board works for black poor black children. Yeah. They need access to a high quality curriculum. They need access to um, uh, uh, qualified teachers. They need an educational experience that is immersed in literacy and that is that is rich and and where they have to read and write and create authentic thoughts that come from them. And I feel like far too often we experiment with low income students and black children in particular, because we don't know what to do. But when you see the schools that are making a difference, these are the schools that believe in those tenets of an effective school. And one of those tenets is around high quality instruction. So how we have tried to address this in CPS is through two things I'll talk about. Of course, there, there are a, a lot of things, but two that stand out. One is creating academic programs in our school. Um, Chicago Public Schools is a school choice district. All students have a neighborhood school that they are zoned to, but we also have a variety of selective enrollment, magnet, IB programs, et cetera. What we notice in those schools, besides the selection criteria, which definitely gives those schools an advantage, all of them have a strong academic program and curriculum. There is clarity around what students will know and be able to do at each point in time in their high school and elementary experience. What we're trying to do now is introduce those programs, and we've done that in the past few years, into neighborhood schools. And it can't just be the program and name only. We can't just change the you know, moniker or the nomenclature outside. We have to change it with resources, with um, the qualified teachers. We have to train the teachers to deliver that curriculum. And so we have expanded STEM, 
uh, IB, uh, world language programs, arts programming across the board um, in many of our schools. And what we've done in that process is, as opposed to the district coming up with ideas for schools, we engage the community. So schools have to basically say, this is a program that we want in our school. And that kind of engagement gives them agency, but it also leads to a higher likelihood that the program is gonna be successful. The second thing that we are currently working on, and this is an ambitious project, is to create a fully aligned curriculum from pre-K, I'm sorry, from kindergarten, through 12th grade in all of the core areas in Chicago. And it is going to be online. Um, it's gonna be front facing to our students and us being thrusted into COVID has actually accelerated that project in some ways because we were gonna be spending a year on teacher training. Our teachers were thrown into the deep on you know, using technology. And so we're just trying to take some of those lessons that, that came out of, um, that, that are coming out of this remote environment and pulling that over. But with that said, by the summer of 2023, we intend to have a fully aligned curriculum so that algebra doesn't look different on this part of town uh, as opposed to this part of town. That's the current case. And even if it means that you have to do more scaffolding and provide more support and more enrichment in order for students to be at the same level, every teacher should know without equivocation, what students should be doing at any particular grade level. I feel like that's one of the biggest equity issues. And in our equity work, you know, the district takes ownership for the resource allocation and the policy work. Like we make those decisions every single day. Yeah. But what we're pushing our teachers on is that you make a decision every single day about what kids do in the classroom. Yeah. And when you give them easy work or no work or the same work they did the year before, you are contributing to the inequities that we're all uh, so-called fighting against. So equity is embedded in all of our work and everybody in this organization has a role in advancing it. Mm, I love that, Janice. Does anybody want to build on it? Yeah, I'll, I'll dive in um, quickly. I'll say that, you know, my vision is, you know, similar to Janice's. You want, you know, broad programs. Uh, I'm a math teacher by training, and I can tell you that having taught math for years, that there's a deep inequity when it comes to elementary mathematics. Mm. Uh, mm. And so we've turned our focus in Ferguson to making sure that we have good, deep, quality curriculum. Uh, teachers who are well prepared and what we found in elementary schools um, is that teachers sometimes lack the content knowledge in order to be able to teach the standards like they ought to be taught in ways that kids really get the deep learning and I say mathematics because I believe strongly in STEM and STEAM careers um, and in order to get students prepared for those careers which includes being a physician or a scientist or whatever the case math is the foundation of that and when our babies leave, and whether they're a white baby or a black baby, I'm not going to hold anybody's child back. I want all of them to get it. But we know black kids haven't been getting it, and our black boys in particular. Um, and so elementary mathematics, I'm, th this is a clarion call to the world that we have got to teach our children. I know reading is important, and I stand with that. I love to write. Um, but mathematics has to be at the foundation of that in classrooms. And so what we've turned our attention to in Ferguson is making sure that when kids leave uh, second grade, by the time they get to third grade, they ought to have the skill sets. And, and let me tell you why we say that. You know, just like I do, that when students get to sixth grade, having taught middle school and high school math, sixth grade is the bottleneck year. If you're not in free algebra in sixth grade, then you get tracked in mm -hmm. a path that mm -hmm. doesn't get you to the AP classes by the time you graduate from high school. Do you wonder why the kids in Japan do better than the kids in America? It's not because there's something different about the kids in Japan's brains or the kids in America. It's the access to the kind of experience that gives them the skills they need. Kids graduate from schools in Japan with AP calculus. Our kids, our standard in America is algebra one. Our babies will never get to those kinds of careers if we don't make mathematics uh, a strong uh, focus in our elementary schools. And so for me, the vision is really clear. Let's make sure mathematics, because when kids get you know, math strongly early, the confidence goes off the chart. Uh, most people who say, I'll end with this, most people who say they aren't good mathematicians or don't didn't do good at math in school, it's not because you couldn't, especially girls. It's because you didn't have a great teacher mm. who understood the content. And so I think you have to have that in order to be able to provide students by the time they get to sixth grade, access to those opportunities. Yeah. 
it's just it's interesting that you say math. I I pick um, science. I used to always say if children in elementary school could get regular science every day, it's the hypothesis making, it's the experimenting, it's the inquiry base, it's the project base, it's the failing at the science learning how to fail and move forward. But, you know, of course, math is such a big part of science as well. But, um, you know, I think that uh, science is just so important now to everything in the future and Im important to what children are going to need to know in the future in terms of their next jobs and what we don't even know really what we're preparing them for and what that's going to look like in the future. Um, yeah. People would be pretty surprised to find out. And I was shocked coming from Minnesota to Massachusetts that, in our school district, uh, high schools can pick their own graduation requirements. Mm. Oh. And so there's no standard across all of our high schools, 36 high schools on what it, what is a diploma. Oh. And so that's one of the first policies we need to pass here. We were a little sidetracked because of pand uh, the pandemic, uh, but we have to get clear coherence about what our North Star is. Mm. What are we shooting from? To, to know what excellent is and what a diploma means yeah. and move backwards from there on what uh, you want to put in place. And I wanted to speak to a couple of things that I, I didn't hear explicitly from my colleagues, but I know that they also very much support. And that is the students who are speaking uh, are still learning English, right? And yeah. so how do we support our EL learners and our immigrant students um, through yeah. language programs, the immersion programs, or through programs with ethnic studies so that they see themselves in their in their uh, work or how do we think about our curriculum and who teaches our kids and the diversity of our teacher pool and the, the professionals who are around them and the profound experience that they'll have when they see people who look like them in the books that they read and in the people who are working directly with them. Those things are uh, uh, are how we deliver excellence. Those things are how we set an expectation uh, for our kids. And you know, presenting the absent narratives uh, that have been missing from our curriculum, and really taking an anti-racist lens. I mean, it's so easy. We started, I think, the first decade of my career talking about multiculturalism, you know, and kind of yeah. this pluralistic society, and then we got to equity. Um, and that was different from equality, right? Which came after equality and then equity. And now it's this act, you know, active kind of voice about being anti-racist. And so it's a, it's a sharpened kind of focus on this work that we have in front of us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Ibrahim Kendi says it the best in his book where he says, you know, it's like the conveyor belt in the, in the um, airport where you're all on the same equity vision, everybody's feeling good about going in the same direction on the conveyor belt, but it's the person who goes against the conveyor belt, you know, mm -hmm. it's the person who's working against the systems that are, and the structures that are the barriers that are, that's the hard work. That's, that's mm -hmm. the hard work we have ahead of us. Yeah. yeah, and I just have to lift up, I mean, to be a, a warrior for racial equity, as I know you three are, you have to have some pretty serious instructional chops right, in these roles. And it's, I've got to tell you, it's really refreshing to hear you talk in a deep way about instruction, um, a deep and powerful way, and, and acknowledge to your point, Brenda, that your, uh, your understanding of it is evolving, right, um, over the years, decade to decade. You're getting a deeper and richer understanding of what anti-racist instruction looks like, that it's not enough to teach math, but you have to create a, an environment where students can have a, a, a deep sense of belonging in order to be in a productive struggle that that is required to learn math well. I mean, I so appreciate that. And, and that, that there are all kinds of implications for the way the system has to be designed to support it. Um, but I wanna ask you this question. Um, and I think that Brenda, you tapped into it a little bit just now. Um, over the decades, we're getting smarter and smarter. In the last 20 years, we have been defining and measuring our success, largely based on standardized assessments. Oh, and, don't get me started on that. Well, in, in, in many ways, we were defining the problem. Um, uh, uh, we were defining it as the achievement gap, right? And our job was to boost test scores and narrow achievement gaps. And I just, I'm, I'm curious about how you're thinking about defining success these days. Do we need to start thinking about it differently? 
Um, I mean, that's an authentic question. Does anybody want to take a shot at that? Joe, do you want to kick Yeah, that? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I think about it often. Um, you know, test scores will be around. They're not going anywhere. I, I want to know how how well my son knows the content. And I just want to add before I just talk about some of these sort of ways to measure success is that teacher quality, let's never forget, you, you know, that part of uh, that whole sort of instructional core. I said quality, not color, teacher mm -hmm. quality. Um, and, and, and what that teacher thinks about the student that's in front of him or her. Um, it determines what that, that, that child or children, what they get. Uh, so, I, so I just want to highlight that. But I think that when we think about measuring what success looks like in the future, um, you, know, uh, you know, yeah, I want them to know math well, but I also, I think we need a meter that measures uh, things like grit uh, and empathy, uh, humility, um, because what I try to teach my son is how to be a good person, uh, how to uh, care about other people, be empathetic, uh, towards others who are more or less fortunate than you are, but because they're humans and that's what we all share. Uh, for, uh, persistence, um, I think is another important one, but here's one that sometimes we sort of throw to the, to the wayside. And I wanna bring this out right now, that, that, that forgiveness is another quality and how we measure that, I don't necessarily know yet, but I think we need some way to measure how we forgive because you know, in this time of COVID and so many other things going on with climate, and economics and race, um, you know, people have been hurt in, 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 in so many different ways. And what we've got to learn is to teach our children how to have those kinds of soft skills, if you will, and learn how to forgive when you've been wrong. We often teach that when we talk about restorative practices. Uh, but teaching that uh, charges our students to be the kinds of people that give them the skills they need to operate in this world. Because this world has so many challenges. I mean, we have a great uh, country um, and, and, but I think we have uh, gone by the wayside when it comes to some of those soft skills. And, and I really think that, you know, problem solving citizenship and all those things are important. Uh, but, but I think that that grit and empathy and humility is really important. And then we can teach that to our students and during the times that they're in their formative years, as they matriculate through school and into life and meet other people, especially people who don't look like them, uh, then having those kinds of characteristics are really important. But I think forgiveness can't be forgotten because so many of us have been wronged in so many different ways and we carry that toxic or toxicity mm -hmm. with us. And we've got to learn to forgive people for us and not for them so that we can move on because it allows you to engage and to grow in ways that you couldn't before. Joe, so thank you for sharing that. Does anyone want to chime in on this idea of success? Janice, do you want to get in? Yeah. There? Um, well, a couple things. I think test scores obviously have have their place in measuring student growth, and you know, Joe pointed that out. They're going to be around. And for me, you know, philosophically, I know people fall in different places on this. I'm not against test scores. I think the debate around what how test scores are used is probably much more where I would wanna focus. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is not because of any value that I have towards test scores. It's actually based on my experience as a person who grew up in a low income community. Um, obviously I, I had advantages, you know, I came from a two parent household. My parents prioritized education. They, they did care very much about test scores, grades and all of those things. And it's probably why I'm sitting here today. But, but I guess when I hear on one side of the continuum, which, you know, some people have posited, especially in this environment, you know, we need to just do away with test scores. It sounds good. Um, sounds like defund the police and all those other things. But when you really start talking about what that looks like and you look underneath the hood, I think it's challenged in a lot of ways. And it really is because of the society that we live in. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, when you can convince me that an African-American boy from Inglewood on the South side of Chicago who has done well in his high school experience is put up against a white uh, male student with the same credentials, save the test scores, that they're gonna have the same shot in a university like Harvard or any other university not to call them out. It's, it's impossible, it's right. impossible. And the progress that we have made in particular African-Americans over the past few years, a lot of that has been documented by that progress and on assessments, on graduation rates, college matriculation and graduation rates, et cetera. And so 
I guess as a, as a person who has had a very traditional African-American experience in this country, I find it hard to believe that I'm going to get a fair shake without proving that I'm supposed to be there. I find that hard to believe. Yeah. And sometimes, and this is going to be a little controversial, sometimes the same people who propose this are, you know, they fall under this liberal category, but when really pushed to give up what they have mm -hmm. for a Black or a Latinx student who comes from an economically disadvantaged community, they won't do that. And so I'm not going to look at a student and tell them that test scores don't matter because I know that they do. Mm -hmm. And I also know that parents have a right to know how their children are progressing. One of the saddest things that, that we experienced here in Chicago was the closing of the 50 schools, which you know everybody has opinions about how that, that shook out. And I, I share a lot of them as well. But the one thing that stood out to me, there were many, but one thing that is pertinent to this conversation is how many of the parents didn't know how the school was performing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that they were doing what they were supposed to do, investing in their child, child's education experience, sending them to school every day, getting them the supplies they need, making sure they were on time and respect the teachers. And then at the end of that experience, didn't see the same outcomes for their kids. I think that the adults, me, teachers, principals, all of us included who are paid to educate students should do that. And we should be, we should prove and we should be held accountable to doing that. That's my mm -hmm. personal belief. With that said, it can't be the only thing. Test scores don't tell you everything. And we have to start talking about the inputs. So what does teacher quality look like? Has this school had three different principals in the past three years? What kind of resources have, have this school uh, been provided? What do the facilities look like? Do kids come in and feel bad because the facility looks like, you know, whatever when they arrive? So I think we have to start paying more attention to, to context and some of those qualitative things as well. It can't be all about test scores because even in some of our best schools with the highest test scores, we have other problems there. We have race relation problems. We have, you know, substance abuse problems. No school is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the last thing we have to start looking at is how well do we... Uh, prepare our students and how do we treat them? We should be paying more attention to um, student discipline, um, student transitions, uh, you know, does the school support students? I think those are also other ways we should measure success and success of a school outside of test scores. But I absolutely believe that people, students, student learning should be assessed and educators should be held accountable to uh, making sure that kids are successful. Mm, Janice, I so appreciate that. Brenda, I know you wanna get in on this question, but I wanna ask you the next one. Is it all right? Okay. Okay. I, um, I just, I, I, uh, I so appreciate like the, the nuance in the answers that you've given though. I mean, this is uh, not easy. The inputs have to be measured just as much as the outputs. Janice, thank you for that. And, and Joe, I think you're reminding us that it's always about some combination of data. It, it can't be just about the numbers. How are you uh, hearing about the, the people, how are you hearing from the people represented in those numbers, right? right? right. What story would they tell about the experience that they're having uh, that led to whatever those outcomes are, good, bad, or somewhere in between? Um, it's the weaponization of data, right? That I think yeah. we're great about. Um, and that's our job. We've got to figure out how to stop that from happening in the future. Brenda, I know you want to get in. Say what you- No, what that's you okay. I, I can wait for your question and then I'll add in my little tweet. I know you will. About it before I, I answer will. the question. So I'm going to move uh, us. So we've talked about the vision. We've talked about uh, what success looks like and how to measure it what are the real problems we should be solving, right? Like problem definition matters a lot in this work. And we spend, a, we, we're all working hard, but are we working hard at solving the real problems that stand in the way of success? So I'm curious from your perspective, what, what problems should we be solving? Well, this goes a little bit to um, the testing question, I think, and how you measure success. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go to like what the input is. And the first thing is, is that I think I'll just say three things really quick about testing. I'm not, I mean, people know me, know I'm not a fan of standardized testing. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't think that 
students should be assessed. I think that students should absolutely be assessed. They should be formatively assessed. That should be public data. I believe that parents should have it. Students should have it. People, sh they should know how they're doing on their competencies and as they um, make their trajectory. So that's important. But I think there is critically, and I think Janice, um, it, this is why she's doing the coherence across her curriculum, is because there is a gap between what is taught and what is tested, clearly. And teachers are in the classroom not teaching what is actually being tested. And then kids are being told that they are not proficient. And I don't. Th I think we don't do enough to very much understand the child psychology behind what we do to third graders when we tell them they're not proficient. And then we tell them again in fourth grade. And we know that they've had a substitute teacher all year. Or we know that you know the teacher's not teaching the curriculum or the standards. Or we know that the assessments they're using, we've not done any interventions you know, during the school year to help this child. Or we know that this child was retained and they didn't get summer school. I mean, all of these other pieces that need to be in there to ensure that children don't fall behind the gaps. What are we doing with that assessment information and how are we helping to support the child? And what are the stakes on that you know, to the educator and who's being held accountable? Like when children are retained, um, they are being held accountable more so than the adult mm. that failed them, right? And so, you know, how is that fair and how does that help the child? And then sometimes they're reassigned to that exact same teacher the next year. And so, you know, what kind of policies do you put in place so that teachers do not, um, you know, are held accountable for the success of children? I think that that is important. So to you know, get at your point, like what is the bigger things that we should be dealing with right now? I think it is the structures and the policies and the systemic barriers put in front of children so they don't have opportunity and access. And we should apply a, a, a sharp lens to that and be bold in the actions that we take to change those. You know, uh, for instance, we have an attendance policy here. Three times that year, um, tardy, you get a you get a um, an absence then three times your absence, you automatically fail. Mm. So if you're a homeless kid and you've missed your, your time, you have three times your absent, you've automatically failed. Like, why come to school then, mm. right? Um, and so, I mean, it's these kinds of things that are barriers or, you know, how you retain students, you know, finding out that black girls are retained three times more than uh, white students are, you know, why going back in the system to figure out what is it that we have in place and then getting at those beliefs, those actions, those steps and behaviors that you need to then put in place with training for your teachers, training for your administrators and making sure that they're taking those actions because you're not just gonna change their beliefs in a day. They gotta have experiences that change then their behavior that then change how they interact with children. And then just finally, I'll say, you know, I, I said before, it's an all hands on deck. I think that the the, the nucleus of helping the child is helping the family. And I don't yeah. think that we can help children without supporting the family. Um, you know, it always comes back to stable housing, food access, health access, job security for parents. And what are we doing to, to help in that whole entire uh, system to help the child have a stable life home? So when they come to school, the only yeah. thing that they're worried about is doing their work or seeing their friends. Um, it's not, they're not worried about what's going on in their neighborhood, what's going on with their parents, why, you know, not having enough food, not having mm -hmm. not having a bed to lay their head. I mean, these are the things that we allow. We allow, mm -hmm. we, in the US, we have the highest child poverty yeah. for, um, you know, a country like ours. It, this is ridiculous. This mm -hmm. is ridiculous that we allow these things to happen for our children. Anyone else want to talk about what problem or problems yeah. you're trying to solve? And then I want I'll to just, a question from the audience. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I'll, I'll just play off of uh, what Brenda said and to Janice's point too, um, because I think we're all focused. Joe is our children in schools. That's why we we're there. Was families and making sure that we are focusing on the families and and I want to call out our moms. Um, because they work so hard and, you know, they, uh, especially those single moms who are trying to make it happen. Um, you know, my mom, my grandma, those black women uh, did what they could to make sure I showed up every day, was clean and was ready to learn. 
And, and our moms struggle because those are the ones who are at the homes educating children most and then grandma mom stepping in when mom can. And I want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge them because I see you and I see the struggle. Um, and I think for me, you know, my generation has changed uh, in that, you know, I'm first generation college and I'm able to provide my son now. Uh, we are with a quality home and, and, and a place where he can learn and do. Um, and those women worked hard to give me that when I was growing up. And, 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 and that shift happened because of a quality education. Um, and so if we can put, turn our attention to moms and families and dads, because there are many dads out there who are working hard and trying to do it on their own, mostly moms, but I acknowledge all of you because if we really want to focus on equity, you know, we're in a country, the richest country on earth, many say, um, and we can sign a, a bill and dole out two and three trillion dollars. There's no reason we can't educate every child extremely well. It makes no sense. Yeah. We shouldn't be having these conversations about black kids and brown kids not getting a quality education with teachers not being paid well or, um, you know, violence and uh, communities not being safe when we can uh, do the things that we do and, you know, a, a matter of a vote. Uh, so let's make education a priority. Let's pay teachers mm -hmm. like they ought to be paid so that they can go in classrooms and teach children extremely well. Uh, let's support our schools so our children can get the kind of quality they need every day. Because to me, the issue is quality. When you go in schools that are mostly black and brown, the resources aren't there, as Janice has said. The teachers, uh, you know, uh, you have teachers in school that were kids that look like me mostly are, are less experienced than other schools, largely because they're underpaid and overworked. Um, so, so let's solve these issues uh, from a policy perspective, but let's make sure we don't forget about our families because that is where the rubber meets the road is making sure that we support our moms. And so I just want to shout out to my mom, uh, my grandma, rest their soul, and all the women who make it happen every day. Hey, mom. Here's to the moms. Um, I, um, I, I, I think this is also a really interesting conversation in that when I started out as an educator over 20 years ago. The way I was coached was that you should only try to influence with what's in your sphere of control. Do you yeah. remember those coaching conversations, <laughs> right? Where everyone's nodding, yeah. yeah. And I yeah. coached other people. Me too. Thinking that way. <laughs> Why am I regretting that now? It's not the way we should be functioning. Yeah. We have all this insight into students and families and what they need. And we have to be using it to influence this larger environment, right? All yeah. the institutions that are responsible yeah. for taking care mm. of families and children, as an example. Mm. We got to step up, right? Mm. We got to push harder, not just within, yeah. but without. Mm -hmm. And that actually feels really supportive of teachers to me, too. Yeah. Mm. Right? I feel like my teachers wanted to see me out there pushing harder. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because everything falls on them. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And we've talked a lot about what teachers need to do in this conversation today. I, the way I'm interpreting that is, is, uh, it just, it, it, it's, uh, uh, it emphasizes how important the teaching profession is, yes. right? Yes. And how it, it all comes down to our teachers at the end of the day. So I so much appreciated it, but in these roles, the soups, we've gotta be pushing on the larger institutions yeah. that surround us. Yeah, yeah, teachers make it happen. I mean, I, I, I cannot preach that enough. And I'm a teacher at heart. And, yeah. you know, somebody, we better start respecting our teachers like we ought to, because those are the ones, you know, and, and, and all of them, you know, it's because of a, a white female teacher who probably didn't wear 100 pounds wet who taught me trig in high school that gave me a good foundation. I don't care what color you are. I want, we've got to make sure we put teaching as the most important profession. They train doctors, lawyers, and everybody else. We better respect our teachers like we ought to. Yeah, you know, this COVID time has been a time where we really, as a country, understand the critical role of teachers yeah. and the critical role of public education uh, in not only our democracy, but in, you know, how we educate our kids, how we prepare for our future workforce, yeah. um, how we support our community culturally. Uh, you know, all of the community events that happened at schools that you can't do the athletics, you know, and prep, I mean, everything happens initially in schools and that is because of teachers. Absolutely. And so, you know, they are feeling now like they are not 
um, they have this weight of the world on them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they just feel, if you, if you go and talk to a teacher right now in COVID, they are hurting. Yeah. And they are hurting for their kids because they want them in, they want their kids to come yeah. to them. And they're hurting because they know they can't give them what they need. I know as an educator, I am, you know, my special ed kids who are mm -hmm. autistic, you know, our kids who have behavioral problems and need behavior supports, you yeah. know, our kids who are in foster care, kids that we know are being abused or neglected at home. You know, it mm -hmm. is just, it's wearing on all of us because yeah. we want them back in. And so, you know, we've got to be able to solve this, throw everything at it. To, so to see our, you know, leadership at the federal level, not taking this thing seriously is just so disheartening. It is. And, um, you know, it's just frustrating, frustrating, frustrating uh, for us who are here in the trenches trying to, you know, just take care of our kids. Okay. I cannot believe our hour is almost over. Oh, really? it is, we, need a, we, need a, we need a part two, <laughs> I think. Oh, and Part Lord. three. <laughs> Let's make it a series. <laughs> that means I was talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you just one last, like, 60 seconds. I'm not going to actually time you, but I want you to try to hold yourselves accountable for this. A 60-second response to this question what is your advice for leaders who want to step up and lead for equity, even if they haven't done so in the past? Who wants to do it? 60 seconds each. Joe, do you want to kick it off? I think if yeah, you I, I like can. you're I was, ready. You know, I always <laughs> want to, um, <laughs> I, I think I'll quickly say, you know, I have this little phrase I use. Uh, it's, it's not your fault, but it's your fight. Mm -hmm. um, it's not your fault, but it's your fight. And I know that the issues we see in our country, even back to slavery, uh, and Black folks didn't start at slavery, so I want to say that. Mm -hmm. Look, we, we, we've had so many issues in this country for years, and when we show up each day, um, we didn't start some of these issues that we have in our public schools, uh, achievement gaps and other things. But when we sign up for this work, then it becomes our fight. And, and we have to grab that, I'm a, you know, I'm from the South, we, 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 we grab bulls by the horn. Um, and we've got to tackle these issues like our life depends on it. Um, and, and I believe strongly that for those leaders who want to step up and lead for equity, uh, take courage and heart and go in and get it done. Because listen, you are Superman and Superwoman, and your children are waiting on you. They're not waiting on somebody else. You're there. It's when you summon the wheel and get it done. It's not your fault, but it's absolutely your fight. All right, right on. Brenda, how about you? What's your advice? Well, I have a saying that goes, you know, measure everything in child benefit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the bottom line, you're measuring everything in child benefit. So when the politics tell you you can't, mm -hmm. You lean in, you stand up, you demand better, you open the door, mm -hmm. you tell your truth and you gather your data and your reasons why, and then you work a process. And that has to be a transparent process with people at the table, your naysayers mm -hmm. and your supporters. But you have to bring those who are against you at the table to be able to move the agenda forward so that they can see the truth, not just from you top down telling them, but from everybody, you know, ha hashing it out because then they can hash it out together and then you come out with something on the end, other end. And then I would say, don't expect the, you know, the perfect to be, to be the enemy of the good or however that, yeah. mm -hmm. that, you know, you make progress and then you make more progress. Yeah. Um, as you build confidence and trust within your community. So take it, take, take a, a small win and then then take a bigger win, but don't just, don't take, don't wait for that big win. Yeah. All right. All right. Jim, yeah. How about you? What's your advice? No, I'll, I, I'll build on what Brenda said um, about not trying to come up with the most perfect plan or the biggest idea that's going to change the world because, you know, we've been in this position for hundreds of years. We're not going to change it, you know, during my tenure here as CEO, but you do have to have this idea of slow 
sustained, continuous process over time. If you think like that, we're moving in the right direction. And my advice would, you know, goes to a couple of people. Number one, if you're working in a school setting, um, whether that's K-12, pre-K through 12 or higher ed, race should be something that is talked about. And when we avoid that, we actually do everyone a disservice. And this isn't mm -hmm. just about black children or uh, Latino students. This is everyone. Everyone benefits from having these open conversations. White students benefit from having a better understanding of the experience of minorities in this country. And so don't be afraid of that. I think you would have you would see far more student engagement if you open up these discussions and get the training that you need. I know a lot of people are fearful of having these discussions, whether it's through a leadership perspective or as a teacher, um, there's training out there. So, so take advantage of that. Um, I think the other piece is uh, just be authentic. Um, I think that after the murder of George Floyd, we saw a lot of, you know, platitudes and things. And, you know, it, it only took me a couple of days before I was over it. Um, but it, it's more than just saying it. It's more than a black circle on your Instagram. You really have to do it. And people just appreciate the attempt. It's okay to ask, did I get that right? Is this okay? How should we do it? And then the last piece is if you are a leader or someone leading this work, don't ask the one or you know the handful of minorities to lead the work. Um, it feels like the right thing to do and an empowering thing to do, but it actually puts a lot of pressure on them that's unwarranted. I think it's much more powerful to get the experts to come in, number one, because just because I'm black doesn't make me an expert on black people, okay? There are people who are experts and know how to have these discussions across culture with different groups. And, you know, obviously solicit or elicit their input and engage them, but don't make the person feel like they have even more responsibility. Because that's something that I hear a lot, especially from my friends who work in like corporate settings. They're all like the chief equity officer now, plus their other job, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you are all so inspiring to me. Um, when we say leadership, right, we mean the people who are out there doing the work, right? It doesn't matter what your title is, roll up your sleeves, dig in, um, our children need all of us. Um, I want to thank everyone who joined us today. I want to thank all three of you for being here and and sharing your wisdom with us. Everyone stay in touch and check out hgsc.me forward slash future to rewatch this and find out about our upcoming episodes. Take care and stay well, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you.